Uh, good morning, everyone. The meeting will come to order. The clerk will note the roll. There is a quorum. We have the minutes of the last meeting before us. And uh, Mr. Marks pointed out the tiniest of technical corrections in that if you go to the very end, uh, the 9.20 p.m. should be a colon rather than a period. <laughs> so does anyone want to uh, make a motion to uh, uh, approve the minutes with that? Uh, Representative Carlson moves we approve the minutes of the January 21st meeting. Any other uh, corrections, additions, changes to the minutes? And, and Mr. Chairman, I won't ask for a roll call. Oh, well, that's nice, Representative Carlson. Thank you. Uh, all right. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Minutes are approved. All right. Um, members, our topic today is uh, the medical assistance program. And uh, if you look in your packet, I want to direct you to a couple of uh, handouts that I've uh, had to kind of set the stage for the meeting. The first one is a copy of the last... Uh, November budget forecast, uh, this uh, handout right here that I'm holding up. And if you see it, uh, you will see I've actually had uh, Shirley highlight a couple of items. And that is that uh, the projected spending for the biennium that we are in right now, the biennium that ends June 30th, in total is $39,338,000,000. And the projection that you can also see highlighted for the upcoming biennium, the forecast spending, if there are no changes in law, and of course we'll be changing many laws, but if there was no change, it would be $41,243,000,000. So the difference is about $1.9 billion. Uh, so I want to have you keep that in mind. I think everyone here probably knows that already, but the second one, the second handout I want you to look at, this one which uh, should be in your packet. You'll see it's the uh, Health and Human Services General Fund budget. And if you look at the highlighted line, medical assistance grants, you'll see the forecast for the biennium we're in is that we will be spending $8,516,000,000. And you'll see the forecast for the next biennium without any changes in the law, best projection we can get is $9,950,000,000. Now why do I emphasize that? That shows that this item uh, without any change in law is projected to go up $1.4 billion in the next biennium. And the, our total state budget general fund is projected to go up $1.9 That means that this one line item is projected to go up more than every single one of the other hundreds of line items that the state has put together. Um, and uh, given this uh, large line item, uh, given how much it's increasing, I think that it's uh, worthy of a hearing of the Ways and Means Committee. This isn't any comment on the merit of this particular item. I certainly think that uh, we need to have a medical assistance program and no one's talking about getting rid of it. But just in terms of how um, much this affects our budget, I think it's worth looking at. I should also mention that this is not a new item. I remember when I was first given the honor of chairing this committee Back in 2002, I remember in the 2003 budget that this item then was projected to go up close to $900 million. So this isn't a, a new phenomenon. This uh, particular line item has been increasing at a, uh, very, by a very large amount for many years. But I just uh, felt that it was appropriate for this uh, committee to look into this uh, very large line item and why it is increasing at uh, such a large amount. And that's the purpose of this meeting today. So I would encourage people to ask questions of the department and dig into this. Uh, Representative Kahn. Yes, well, Mr. Chairman, one of the things we've been talking about, I think your party has been talking about it in Congress a lot, is this concept of dynamic forecasting that you've got to look at what's going to happen. And one of the problems is if we don't meet, I assume that general medical general assistance, uh, that this kind of thing meets medical care at a very primitive, at a very low level. And what happens if we don't do this and people end up using emergency rooms, which the local governments totally pay for and so forth? That, you know, 
I, one of the few things that I know about this subject, which is nothing, is that emergency room care is the most costly and least effective of any care that anyone gets. Well, Representative Kahn, I understand that's true. And again, my bringing this forward as a item of discussion is not a comment on saying that we should cut it so we can have more emergency room visits. It's uh, simply a comment that uh, this is a very rapidly growing large item within our state budget that is gobbling up a huge amount of the budget and uh, we need to delve into it, see if there are ways that we can deliver these services more efficiently uh, and better, uh, try to understand why this is going up. You know, I guess I'm tempted to say that at the end of this session, you know, there's always going to be some people at the end of the session that say, gee, I, I wish we had given more money to education. And uh, when someone tells me that, if we don't do anything about this, I'll say, well, the reason we didn't uh, is partly due to this medical assistance program. And there will be some people that say, wow, I wish we could have cut taxes more. And I'll say, well, if we don't do anything about this, part of the reason is this medical assistance program. And again, this is a very important program that meets a lot of very important basic needs. I'm not saying, you know, we're certainly not talking about getting rid of it or anything. I'm just saying that as a committee that is charged with looking at the finances of the state, we need to understand a program that has seen these kind of increases. And, and that's my purpose in having our meeting today. Um, I guess I'll bring out uh, one other um, item that I just uh, had put in the packet today, and that is you'll see an article from the Wall Street Journal that I saw a couple months ago uh, entitled Reversing the Medicaid Tidal Wave in Illinois. Uh, this is an article I saw that uh, talks about uh, what the state of Illinois was doing on a bipartisan mm -hmm. basis dealing with medical assistance in that state. I'm not recommending this approach. I really don't know anything more about what they did other than what I've read in this newspaper article. Uh, but uh, other states are dealing with this same problem. Uh, here's one state uh, that uh, underneath the administration of Democratic Governor Pat Quinn uh, chose to deal with uh, their problem in this particular way, and I think it's uh, food for thought. I'm certainly very interested in hearing what other states uh, may have done or what other members may know about what other states have done or what other ideas other members may have. And so in that spirit, I want to uh, move forward with the committee hearing today, and I will, uh, if there are no other questions, I'll ask uh, Mr. Welch to come forward, and after uh, we're hearing from the department, um, our legislative auditor, Jim Nobles, uh, has done some work in this area, some extensive work over a number of years, and I'd like to uh, have him uh, talk to the committee. But uh, with that, uh, uh, could I have, uh, I see a couple people up at the witness stand, if they would uh, introduce themselves and give their name for the record. Sure. Mr. Chair, my name is Sean Welch. I am the Director of the Reports and Forecast Division of the Department of Human Services. Mr. Chair, I'm Susan Snyder, the Assistant Director of Reports and Forecasts. Uh, Mr. Welch, Ms. Snyder, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so as you just discussed, um, we've been asked to provide some more detail um, on the biennial change in medical assistance between the 1415 biennium and the 1617 biennium. So um, we have. This is the Let me get organized here. Okay, we have generated this two pager um, front and back um, that, uh, that goes through um, and um, breaks out the $1.4 billion change into um, different budget activities and then. Um, from there, it breaks it out into um, changes that are um, the result of enrollment increases or decreases, and um, changes due to average cost um, increases or decreases, changes due to federal share changes, and then other factors. So to start, I'll just start at the very top. Um, that top block, when we do the MA forecast, we projected in five basic budget activities. And those five activities are at the top left. Um, Long-term care facilities is the first. Um, 
Long-term care facilities include nursing facilities and ICF DDs, which are facilities designed to care for developmentally disabled individuals. Um, then the next is long-term care waivers. Uh, long-term care waivers include five waivers which provide MA services to elderly and disabled children um, and adults and um, and those services are services that would not be covered under Medicaid outside of a waiver. Also included in the long-term care waiver section are um, personal care assistance and some private nursing services. The next group is elderly and disabled basic. Um, that provides basic care for elderly and disabled individuals. Basic care is sort of the traditional health care that we, that we think of. The next is adults without children. The Adults Without Children is Minnesota's expansion group under the ACA, and that provides basic care for, for that group. The last um, basic budget activity under MA forecast is Families with Children Basic, and Families with Children Basic provides basic uh, health care coverage to um, families, uh, well, children, parents, and pregnant women. Um, and also included in this budget activity are um, some miscellaneous categories, the biggest of which is pharmacy rebates, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, um, members, as we're going through this, if you have some questions, uh, feel free to, uh, to uh, wave your hand and break in, because this is our topic for the day. And I, I know that Mr. Welch has <coughs> excuse me, got a lot of information here, but I, I want to be able to make sure that we can uh, dig into it and understand it. Mr. Welch. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, if you look at um, the biennial difference for each of these categories, uh, for long-term care facilities, um, that's a very small change relative to the $1.4 billion. Um, the next long-term care um, waivers and the, the home care, um, of the three basic areas that have increases, um, long-term care waivers is about a quarter of those increases, about $400 million over the biennium to biennium. The elder, elderly and disabled basic accounts for another quarter of the, of the increase um, for those three categories, about $450 million. The adults without children um, provides an offset. That offset is due to the enhanced federal share on the ACA expansion group. Um, I'll, I'll detail that uh, in just a little bit. Um, and then the families with children basic, um, as you can see, provides uh, or adds about um, half of the, the increase um, from biennium to biennium. The other, uh, the other two categories there, alternative care, Alternative care provides um, services to um, 65 and older age individuals, services that are similar to the elderly waiver, <coughs> um, but it provides those services to um, individuals whose income is above MA, but are at risk of nursing facility placement. And this is a bit of an odd budget item because it has an appropriation outside of MA, um, but current law provides that unspent funds in this alternative care um, appropriation cancel to the MA account. And that's why you see those negative numbers under the biennial columns. Um, those are cancellations of unspent um, alternative care appropriations to the MA account. So when you look at the $11 million increase, basically what that is telling you is that the alternative care forecast is increasing by $11 million over the two biennium. And that accounts for a small piece of the $1.4 um, billion dollar increase. Excuse me, uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Welch, I want to uh, just, uh, if you could, just explain uh, a little bit more about the on <coughs> line 14 families with children <coughs> slash basic. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you might elaborate uh, for, for us what basic means as it would compare to the medalist plans. Or, in, in another analogy, compare that to what would be available uh, in the private markets in terms of the type of coverage that would be available uh, inside or outside the ACA. Mr. Welch. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative, um, I am not sure what the actuarial value is of the, the MA um, basic 
plan or the basic coverage plan. Um, I could tell you that it provides um, a fairly rich benefit set. I think it, it my, my, my hunch is that it is um, richer than what you'd find in the lower metal tiers. But I, I'm, I, I'm not quite sure what the, the actuarial value, how to make a, 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 a straight comparison to what you would find in the private market. Uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, Mr. Welch, I think it would be appreciable to have that information. So if your agency could provide uh, the actuarial value that that would be uh, worth uh, across all the lines, uh, I've heard some uh, uh, not rumors, but in uh, establishing uh, perspective that it might be uh, on, on par with the platinum. And we have other considerations in mind as well. So if that could be provided to the committee, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay. We'll do. Mr. Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the last uh, piece in the, the top block, um, healthcare access funding offsets. Um, in the um, 2000, um, what session was that? In the, in a prior session, I can't remember which session it was. Um, it must have been the 2013 session. Um, there were a bunch of shifts that took place between programs, and um, notably, there were a number of uh, enrollees from Minnesota Care that were shifted over to MA, and that will play a role in in what we're going to talk about in the future. <laughs> And at the same time, um, there, the, the legislature appropriated um, health care access fund money to pay for pieces of the medical assistance program. And, um, and so what you're seeing there is the health care access fund offsets in each of the biennium um, toward paying for the, the medical assistance forecast. And the, the minus 49 million in the biennial difference just indicates that there is $49 million out of the healthcare access fund um, that's forecasted in the 1617 biennium over and above what's forecasted or what's appropriated in the 1415 biennium. And Mr. Welch, uh, how much money do you recall will be left uh, in the healthcare access fund at the end of the 2017 biennium if uh, this goes forward? Mr. Chair, um, currently under the November forecast, the health care access fund has a $62 million deficit at the end of fiscal year 17. Okay. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, so that's the, the general overview of how the $1.4 billion is broken into the, the basic MA funding buckets, about a quarter in long-term care waivers, about a quarter in elderly and disabled basic, and about half in families with children basic. So let's jump to actually the back page to the very bottom line, the grand totals by column. You can see in column B, we have the $1.4 billion biennial difference. And then what I've done in column C, um, Oh, uh, Representative Davids. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to the witness. Something, I, I need something clarified here. You had mentioned something about $49 million what was that $49 million? Oh. Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, Mr. Welch. Mr. Chair, Representative Davids. The $49 million is an offset to the, the MA increase because there's more health care access fund money being appropriated in the 1617 biennium to the MA program than there is in the 1415 biennium. So it's an increase in health care access money being used to fund the MA program over the two biennium. Well, Mr. Chairman. Representative Davids. So we're taking $49 million out of the health care access fund to MA, but the fund in 2017 has a $62 million deficit. How do we do that? Uh, Mr. Welch. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Davids. Um, the forecast here um, represents what is appropriated under current law and um, and the deficit, the healthcare access fund deficit, is is something that's going to be have to have to be dealt with this session. Mr. Welch, is there anything statutorily that deals with that that says that if the healthcare, you know, I mean, the healthcare access fund, all these things are forecasted. I mean, if you forecast that the healthcare access fund was going to be 
at zero at the end of the uh, 2017 biennium and, and they ended up with a $62 million deficit. Is there anything in statute that says how that is dealt with? Mr. Chair, this forecast provides um, uh, a piece of the health care access fund picture and Minnesota Care is another forecasted program that provides another piece of that. In terms of um, how the deficit is handled, um, that would be a question that MMB would have to answer. Okay. Okay, maybe we'll uh, get to that later. Did I see another hand? Uh, yeah, Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Welch, as I'm looking at these numbers, um, uh, what, um, looking at the health healthcare access fund offset, um, so that would uh, suggest we, if we added those numbers back in, uh, the actual totals um, for those programs would be quite greater. It would be uh, nine billion approximately for 14 and 15, and um, 10.3 billion cost to the program for 16 and 17. Uh, so the healthcare access fund um, offsets actually mask the size of each of those, and also uh, mask the size of the uh, biennial difference on line 20. Um, so actually it will be Mr. Chair closer to uh, and Mr. Welch closer to 1.5 billion uh, biennial mm -hmm. difference. Is that accurate? No, Mr. Welch. Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative, yes, that is accurate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Welch, um, do you recall how much of a health care access fund offset there was in the 2012 to 13 biennium? Mr. Chair, let me. I, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure that there was a health care act vote, you know. Mr. Chair, there, there was no health care access fund appropriation to MA in um, fiscal years 12 and 13. Okay, thank you. And I, and I really appreciate you. I know we're putting you on the spot with all these questions. Um, and. Uh, but uh, we really appreciate you uh, answering them. This is a, a really critical topic. Uh, Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Welsh. Uh, just kind of looking at your um, your columns in the summary and talking about the health care access fund, we had um, a an initial committee hearing in Health and Human Services Finance on the health care access fund because um, the great shift in projection from just the one forecast to the next of I believe it was over a half a billion dollars uh, from one projection to the next and um, that was uh, primarily as you say because of a one-time shift that was used to balance the budget um, are you aware of any plan to um, fill that up in any sustainable manner or what is the projection for moving forward and also was there discussions about the fact that the source of this revenue is uh, scheduled to be depleted in December of 2019 uh, Mr. Welch Mr. Chair Representative Dean um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Can you, can you um, formulate it a little differently? Um, the, the current law forecast, in terms of the, your second question, um, does not extend beyond fiscal year 19. And, and so there has been no discussions about what's going to happen in terms of the MA forecast or the Minnesota Care forecast beyond fiscal year 19. Um, I'm sorry if I if I'm not quite answering your first part of your question. Uh, Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And well, I guess what I'm trying to point out is that this was a one-time shift. There is no mechanism to pay it back, um, and that we are relying on a revenue source that is going away. Uh, that um, that if uh, when this money was taken from the health care access fund to balance the last biennium budget, uh, there was no plan to pay it back. Um, and now we're having to deal with that long term. 
And um, I just think it's, it's important for people to understand that that swing within just the health care access fund of a half billion dollars is uh, not chump change um, and it is not replenished uh, in any plan. Uh, so that was a one-time shift with no plan to pay it back. Um, also, one of the things that was uh, brought up in the, in the Health Care Access Fund uh, hearing in Health and Human Services Finance Committee was that when we looked at the Health Care Access Fund and why that shifted, if you look at the basic health care plan, the BHP that was talked about, and the hit that that gives our state, uh, and we're the only state in the country that does this, it's about equal to the hole that we put in the Health Care Access Fund just so you uh, can understand the scale of the dollars uh, so that that's going to be one of the things that we're going to be taking a peek at in my committee. Uh, Mr. Walsh, any other response to that? Oh, you don't need to give one, but okay. All right. Um, uh, go ahead then, Mr. Walsh. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so in the bottom on, uh, on row 88, you can see the total, total biennial difference of $1.4 billion in column right. B. And in column C through F, we, we break out that difference into um, changes due to average enrollment, changes due to average monthly cost, changes due to um, changes in or different federal shares mostly, and then in column F, um, a small amount of other factors. So if you look at, uh, at column C, um, a little more than half of the $1.4 billion increase comes from enrollment. Um, if you look at column D, um, we include in the forecast you know, many different types of rate changes, COLAs, and quality-based increases that are authorized by law, plus other trends um, like case mix and utilization changes that appear in our actual data and that affect average cost per person. And these changes account for um, a little under half of the $1.4 billion, um, $880 million. Um, in column E, that, um, that shows an offset of about $400 million toward the, um, the biennial change. And that comes from the change in federal share um, on our expansion group, the Adults Without Children. So let me give you a little chronology of what's happening to federal share on this group. In calendar year 13, as an early expansion group, the Adults Without Children and MA were funded at 50% federal share. And so that encompasses the first six months of the 14-15 biennium. Beginning in January of 14, we started receiving 100% federal share for this group. And we continue to receive 100% federal share in calendar years 16 and 17. I mean, I'm sorry, in calendar years 15 and 16. In calendar year 17, that um, federal share drops to 95%. So for the last six months of the 16-17 biennium, we're getting 95% on federal share on this group. So what you see in the 400 million in, in column E is essentially the value of a half a year at 50% at the front end of the 14-15 biennium versus a half a year at 95% at the very back end of the 16-17 the biennium. And that change in federal share um, accounts for the $400 million offset to the, the biennial change. Mr. Welch, when we expanded uh, MA uh, so that we could get those additional federal monies. Was that mostly uh, MA adults with no children then? Is that what primarily, is that who was primarily affected? The, Mr. Chair, um, the MA adults without children are, cons are, um, are considered our newly eligible expansion group. Um, so yes, they were, this was a group that was not covered by medical assistance before the ACA. Okay, uh, Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, Mr. Welch, uh, on that um, topic, so I remember the, the, the MA expansion was $300 million, and I remember the discussion at the time and the anticipation in the legislature that uh, we were signing up for something that was going to uh, start off as, as fully federally funded, and then 
uh, be reduced in federal funds um, and the taxpayers of Minnesota to become uh, progressively more and more liable for that. Can you uh, remind us what the, uh, what the rest of the picture looks like? Uh, when do we get down to 50%? When do Minnesota taxpayers get to pay for 100% uh, of this commitment that was made um, a couple of years ago? Uh, Mr. Welch. Mr. Chair, Representative, um, the the rest of the, the the chronology is that in calendar year 18, it the the federal share drops to 93 percent. In calendar year 19, the federal share drops to 92 percent, and then beginning in calendar year 20, um, the federal share is 90 percent on this group, and that's where it's uh, scheduled to remain at 90 percent. Um, for to put it into context, in the November forecast, in state fiscal year um, 19, the state share on this group is about $147 million. Uh, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Welch, um, the $268 million that we're saving with these MA adults that weren't covered before, um, is, are we saving that because they were covered by other programs that we had somehow and so they're no longer on, I don't know, Minnesota Care or some other group and we're getting that uh, reduction then? Or where's that coming from? Mr. Chair, um, that's not really a savings. Um, what it is is it's, um, it's more federal money coming in to the, the out biennium, the 16-17 biennium, relative to the 14-15 biennium and supplanting state money. And so it's an, it's an offset to the biennial increase. But I'm saying, when you're saying it's offsetting state money, I mean, what's it offsetting from the biennium before if there wasn't anything? Oh, Mr. Chair, it's, it's saying that um, a dollar of expenditures in the 14-15 biennium in the first half of that, or well, in the first half of fiscal year 14 was funded at 50% match, whereas at the, at the end of the 17 biennium, it's funded at 95% match. And so you're generating a little bit more federal revenue in the, in the out biennium than you are the... Okay, because, yeah, I guess that's what I thought is we, there were some adults that were covered by this before at a very low income. We've just expanded that population, correct? Correct. Mr. Okay, Chair, so correct. basically we're getting the benefit. This $268 million is the result of those uh, very low income MA adults that were being covered before now getting a greater subsidy. Mr. Chair, yeah. beginning in March of 11, um, well, Historically, this group had, was the old GAMC group, and GAMC no longer exists, and some of them were also covered in Minnesota Care. And beginning in March of 2011, um, Governor Dayton opted for the early expansion. And that's, that um, generated this Adults Without Children MA category with, for, um, for adults without kids with income up to 75% of poverty. And under the ACA, the early expansion group, under 75 of poverty, um, was to be funded at 50% federal match until January of 14, when the ACA started. And then states were required to go to 138% of poverty for this group. And we have done that. And once you go to the full expansion, 138 of poverty, then the entire group begins to be 100% federally matched. Um, and then that goes down based on the calendar that we talked about earlier. All right. Um, before I recognize uh, Representative Oginius, I want to recognize a new member of our committee, uh, Representative Gunther, um, who I understand will be taking Representative Kelly's place. Uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Gunther. Thank you. Uh, Representative Oginius. Thank you. Uh, help me understand. Uh, are any of these adults without children veterans or are veterans fully covered by the federal government? Uh, Mr. Walt. Mr. Chair, Representative, um, I, I, I'm not sure how many of our adults without children population are veterans, but these would be, um, these would include only those that, um, that are Medicaid eligible and and I'm not sure I can 
I can answer more than that. Uh, Representative Albright, we're getting us. Did you have another question? Well, that would be interesting to know if if that's part has become part of our responsibility, or if it's not. Okay. Could you uh, check into that and get back to us, Mr. Welch? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Welch, um, I'm going to try to pick up on uh, what Representative Draskowski uh, started. There's a $1.4 you know, billion dollar increase between 14-15 uh, to 16-17, but then uh, in the MMB report it also notes a $1.3 billion increase between 16-17 and 18-19. If you're saying that the, the reduction in the, the federal share goes from 93 down to 92 percent, that doesn't quite equate in terms of the increase uh, that we're seeing on paper here. Is that due to enrollment increases? Is that due to the, the benefit set that is attributable to those populations? Is it because of a decline in other funding or, or, or subsidizations of the program. I'm wondering if you could elaborate in terms of why there is this rapid increase in the overall budget itself. What what does it indicate here? Because we're only looking at 1617 in 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 some uh, detail, but it concerns me that 1819 is just as bad. Uh, Mr. Welch. Mr. Chair, Representative um, I haven't taken a look at specifically the the change from 1617 to 1819. Um, with respect to the adults without children, um, basic care, um, there there is additional enrollment in um, projected in 1819. I mean, I think when we go through more of this, what you'll find um, is that a lot of this is um, is ongoing trend. Some of the um, the big parts of the enrollment increases are going to be ACA related, and the the 16 to 17 to 18 to 19 would be a continuation of um, of the the average cost trend and the the enrollment trends. All right, I've got uh, Representative Carlson and then David's, and then I think I want to uh, have Mr. Uh, Welch continue so we can make progress through. Through this, and so if you have a question, then just uh, raise your hand, and we'll come back to you after we've uh, given Mr. Welch a little bit more time to progress. Representative Carlson, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to go to line uh, 12, and where it says uh, elderly and disabled, basic, and there's uh, a growth there of 456 million. And uh, my question is one of demographics. I think we all hear about the baby boomers now moving into uh, retirement and um, there's sort of an assumption that uh, more and more of them as they move into retirement are also going to be having uh, health care needs and so on. And so my question of Mr. Welsh is uh, what might, be we, might, re, might we expect in that category as a result of the baby boomers? By the way, I'm a pre-baby boomer person, but just barely. Um, but at any rate, uh, as you know, there's a lot of comments about what that's going to mean for health and human services generally. So if he could comment, and maybe that's a question for the state demographer, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Welch. Mr. Chair, I'm going to... Or Ms. Schneider. Ms. Schneider, answer this uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, we do incorporate demographic, uh, demographic projections into the forecast, and we are expecting increased enrollment by the elderly um, because of demographic changes. In the period we're talking about up to 2019, those changes aren't, um, aren't so significant yet. We expect to see more in the future. Representative uh, Carson. Mr. Chairman, I, I know you incorporate them. I, I guess basically you touched on my question there near the end. What, what, what might we expect as we move forward? You just said short term it may not be too dramatic, but long term there would be an escalation. And I was just wondering if you have information on how that projection would take place and how dramatic it might be. Ms. Snyder. Mr. Chair, Representative, we do have, a, um, we do have some reports that deal with projections to the year 2030 that perhaps we can make available to you. All right, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, and then Representative Davids. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To Mr. Welch, do you support circumventing the legislative process? Oh, just. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, sorry, Mr. Representative. Sorry. Davids. Sorry about that. <laughs> there are increased expenses, the way it looks to me here, and, and maybe more ways, but to this. One is the newly covered, and, and we've got some federal money that's come in for that. We've got, or the newly eligible, I should say. And so my question is, and you probably don't have an answer, I maybe could follow up later, but what effect has the ACA not having means testing on people getting put on Medicaid have to do with the costs we're looking at here? I, and we've got reports that uh, with what Illinois did, folks are coming up to Minnesota uh, for uh, various benefits. What does that do? And I guess, and these are for maybe a discussion you, we could maybe talk a bit later, but the governor's proposals on the budget come out tomorrow. There's some huge holes here. Are you aware, I mean, some of the stuff's come out already, are you aware that he's addressing this or are we going to just push it off into 1819 and hope to figure it out then? Well, Mr. Welch, that's a, a, a multi-dimensional question, <laughs> uh, but uh, go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Representative Davis, um, I, uh, I think I'll, tack, I'll try and tackle one piece of that. Um, the 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 enrollees in medical assistance are are all means tested, and um, there's there's income eligibility limits for for all of these enrollees in the various categories. They're different amongst the categories, but they're they're all means tested. Um, and in terms of the the governor's budget, I, I I can't I can't speak to that. Mr. Chairman, Representative Davids, and to Mr. Welch, it's my understanding that if you sign up for Minsure. You, there is no means testing. We have people being put on these programs that own $10 million businesses. Uh, Mr. Walt. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Davids, um, when we do the forecast, um, we look at our enrollment data and, um, and we assume that if a person is enrolled, is, if a person is found eligible either by Mincher or by our, our legacy systems, MMIS, um, or if they're found eligible through paper applications through the counties yeah. or wherever they come in, if they're found eligible, then they're, they're in our data and, um, and they, they go into the forecast. We have no way of being able to pick through our data and try and determine on an individual basis whether or not somebody is or is not eligible. And so to the extent that there are um, issues with the systems and with eligibility determinations, then that's something that would have to be sorted out in, in the future. Well, yeah. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Welch, your statement that everybody has been means tested, I don't think that's correct. Because if you come over from insure, you could own 1,000 acres of farmland be worth 10 million bucks, get put on Medicaid because corn's at $3 instead of seven, and you have $10 million of assets and you're put on the system. So do you stand by this statement that uh, everybody's been means tested that's on these programs? Uh, Mr. Welch, I or we have someone else coming forward, and I know that uh, the um, legislative auditor is going to talk about some of those issues uh, in a while here to Representative Davids. But uh, hello, uh, welcome to the Ways and Means Committee. Can you uh, state your name for the record and answer Representative Davids' question? Sure. Good morning. I'm Karen Justo. I work for the Department of Human Services. Mr. Chair, Representative, I think you're referring to the elimination of asset tests, which had previously applied to certain populations under medical assistance and were repealed under the Affordable Care Act. And uh, that is a change that did occur with the ACA in that there were asset limits previously applied to adults, which would be parents, as well as adults without children, um, which no longer apply. And that is in accordance with federal law. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Chairman, to the testifier. What, what is our definition? I, I don't serve on HHS anymore. I've got seniority, so I don't have to. Um, but what's the difference then between an asset test and a, and a means test? Uh, Mr. Chair Representative, I'm not certain of, of the definition of the means test. The tests that are in play currently are income. It's basically income versus assets. So elig financial eligibility is determined based on an individual's income, okay. which could uh, include self-employment, net profit, or loss, as well as other types of income. Okay, so people are getting on to the program. Mr. Chairman, 
people are getting on the programs without asset tests, so they could be worth 20 million bucks and get on there and, and get money from the state. Uh, Mr. Ms. Chair, Justo, is that is that right, Justo? Justo. Justo, excuse Close. me. Mr. Chair Representative, uh, you're correct in that we do not value assets in the eligibility determination. For families with children specifically, asset tests do remain for our age blind and disabled um, individuals applying for, for Medicaid. So um, it is our, our families and children, which is pregnant women, uh, parents, children, and also adults without children who no longer have an asset test. So, Mr. Chairman, and to the witness, Representative Davids. we'll go after the blind and disabled, but not the rich billionaire uh, landowner. Is that fair to say? Oh. <laughs> well, I'm not sure how many there are, uh, Representative Davids, but uh, Ms. Justo, I think, why don't, uh, I, I think the asset question is certainly a legitimate question, and I, I guess, Ms. Justo, can you ask, I mean, underneath ACA, could we implement asset tests for this population at the state level, or are we prohibited from doing that? Um, Mr. Chair and members, the federal law required the removal of those asset tests. Therefore, we would have to get some specific authority from our federal partners in order to implement um, apart from um, what's provided in federal law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witness. Okay. Um, well, Mr. Welch, why don't uh, I know there's a few other people that have um, also raised their hands here, but as I said earlier, once we were done with Representatives Carlson and Davids, I want to get back to uh, moving on this a little bit, and then I'll uh, go back and uh, or, uh, recognize others. Uh, Mr. Welch, can you continue? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so let's uh, let's start moving through um, some of the, the detail for the, the different funding buckets. I'm going to go back to page one, and we'll start um, at MA long-term care facilities, and we'll just work our way down back down. Okay, so um, for MA long-term care facilities, um, you can see that we've broken out um, that into some some basic components. And then across the, the columns by the enrollment, average cost, um, funding shares, and other factors. So in this particular um, category, long-term care facilities, there's a, a relatively small, a, almost $6 million increase over the, the biennium. And you can see under the enrollment column, um, that enrollment is actually trending down in this category. And so um, there's actually a reduction in expenditures due to enrollment. Um, um, from the biennium to biennium, and that is offset by an increase in biennial expenditures um, due to average monthly cost. And the big piece there is a 3.2% um, rate increase um, authorized in law that um, it was passed in the 13th session that's effective in October of 2015. And that's what's producing the, the $40 million um, um, increase in the nursing facilities line. So that takes care of the, the long-term care facilities piece. Um, the long-term care waivers and home care, if you look at, what is it, line 49, um, you can see that that accounts for about a $400 million biennial increase. Um, about, what is that, two th about three quarters of that is um, due to enrollment. And, um, and the rest of it is due to average cost. Um, on the enrollment side, uh, you can see on row 45, uh, the, the biggest piece of that, almost half of that enrollment increase is in personal care assistance. And um, what's going on there is the past few years, the annual trend in enrollment for PCA services has been about 4% per year. And um, that base forecast um, trend continues into the, the forecast period. Um, so we have forecasted growth of about 4%. Uh, that accounts for about 60% of that $131 million increase. Um, the rest is that we expect additional use of PCA services when PCA changes to community choice in the 16-17 the biennium. And that uh, those additional services through community choice account for about 40% of the $131 million increase. The rest of the enrollment-based increases in um, long-term care waivers and home care are in the DD waiver and the CADI waiver. And um, there, um, the DD waiver is um, 
That provides services to developmentally disabled individuals who are at risk of um, moving into an ICFDD. And the CADI waiver um, provides um, MA services to individuals who are disabled and under 65 years old. And, um, and they're at risk of nursing facility placement. So the enrollment increases in CADI and DD are based on long-term historical trend plus there are current waiver caps in those um, waivers that limit new enrollment into the waivers and those caps are due to expire in July of 2015 and so this adds enrollment on top of the base in the 16-17 biennium. Um, and in terms of the, the shares, the, the base enrollment increases are roughly half of the, the enrollment changes you see here. And the um, expiration of the, the waiver caps account for the other half. In terms of the average cost changes for the long-term care and waivers, um, those are basically driven by, um, by case mix changes, utilization changes over time, as well as um, a couple of um, rate increases authorized in law. And a couple of those are there in the 13th session, there was a 1% rate increase that was passed that becomes effective or became effective in April of 14. Um, and so that has a, dis a disproportionate effect on the 1617 biennium relative to the 1415 biennium. In the 14th session, um, there was a 5% rate increase that was passed that became effective July of 14. And in the 14th session, there was also a 1% quality add-on that was passed that becomes effective July of 2015. And so those are the, the big drivers of the, um, the average cost increases, the, the 165 million that you see on row 49 column D. All right. Um, why don't we keep going? I know I've got a few people, but I think I want to make sure that we uh, get Mr. Welch through this uh, form, and uh, we also have time for Mr. Noble. So, Mr. Welch, why don't you continue? Uh, okay. Mr. Chairman, mine wasn't a question. It's kind of a request for those of us who have never All served. Right, sure. Those of us who have never served on Health and Human Services and kind of Brain impaired on this. Uh, uh, um, can can we always have acronyms kind of spelled out? You know, I was thinking about <laughs> saying that same thing, uh, <laughs> Representative Khan, because uh, there are many acronyms in state government, but none more so than in this area. Uh, so, yeah, Mr. Welch, can you, um, can you half of them. Sure. mention what, can you spell out what CADI and CAC are? I think DD, we got the developmentally yeah. disabled, or else the elderly waiver FFS. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. Um, DD waiver, yep, developmentally disabled. Um, EW is elderly waiver, and, um, and those are waiver services to um, people age 65 and over who are at risk of nursing facility placement. CADI waiver, CADI stands for Community Alternatives for Disabled Individuals. And CADI um, provides waiver services to those age um, 65 or less or 64 or less, um, who are at risk of nursing facility placement. Um, CAC, C-A-C, stands for Community Alternative Care Waiver. That waiver provides um, waiver services to mostly children who are at risk of inpatient hospital. Um, and then BI, I guess we spelled out brain injury waiver. Um, and then... Oh, the FFS is fee-for-service. Elderly waiver is um, split into two pieces. There's the fee-for-service segment, which is included in the, the long-term care and waivers um, section. And then the managed care um, piece of it is included in the elderly and disabled basic care because the managed care piece is an actual add-on to their um, basic capitation payment. And Mr. Walsh, can you explain to, um, I think probably most people are familiar with it, but um, just when you say waiver, can you talk about, I know that that's a federal waiver, but can you talk a little bit more specifically about what that really means? Mr. Chair, um, a waiver in, in the most basic sense, the, the waiver is a way to provide services to these individuals that would not otherwise be covered under Medicaid. 
Okay. Um, all right. Please proceed, Mr. Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so going to the back page, page two, um, the MA Elderly and Disabled Basic Care section. Um, so if you look at row 63, um, you can see that that, uh, um, that accounts for about 450 million of the biennial change and um, about, you know, what is that? About two thirds or so of the, the change is average cost and the rest is enrollment based. And um, enrollment in this group is pretty stable. It, it's growing at about one, a little over 1% per year. Um, the changes here um, in average cost, um, we, you can see, well, let me start here. The, you can see that the elderly waiver managed care piece is here. And this is, um, as I mentioned briefly, the, it's an add-on to the, the elderly um, basic, capi, um, basic care capitation payment. And this is also influenced by those um, rate increases and the quality add-on that I mentioned earlier um, in the long-term care waivers piece, the, the three um, that were passed in the last couple sessions. And so those three increases are what accounts for the 73 million on the elderly waiver managed care um, line. The other two for elderly basic and disabled basic, um, we forecast about a 5% annual trend in average cost per person um, for, for this group. And that's essentially based on long-term historical experience. And so that 5% trend is what drives the $290 million um, increase from biennium to biennium as we extend that into the forecast period. So the last two groups, the MA adults without children and the MA families with children, um, these are the, the two groups that are impacted by the ACA. And, um, and so, so I'm gonna sort of tackle those together to some extent. One of the big things, if you, could, if you look at, um, let's go to the MA families with children line, line 79 um, in the handout. You can see that this accounts for about $869 million of the, the biennial increase, and about half of that is enrollment driven. And um, so back in um, January of 2014, there were a lot of ACA driven shifts that took place, and a big um, piece of those shifts um, came from Minnesota Care. So we shifted in January of 2014 about 100,000 enrollees from Minnesota Care to MA. And these were children, parents, pregnant women, and adults without kids. And essentially at that point, um, um, when it, the state law changed such that if you were eligible for MA, you were no longer eligible for Minnesota Care. And that prompted um, all of these, th this enrollment shift. In it, so we have 100,000 people coming into this budget activity um, from Minnesota Care. And then in addition to that, um, there, we had projected increased enrollment due to other ACA provisions like the coverage mandate. Um, there were um, enrollment, administrative enrollment and process changes that took place. Um, due to the ACA, and there were um, eligibility expansion, income eligibility expansions um, that took place due to the ACA. And those were expected to bring in additional enrollment um, to MA. To put this in context for you a little bit, in the November forecast, um, it is based on actual enrollment data through September of 2014. Previous forecasts had projected the additional enrollment due to these ACA provisions for September of 2014 over and above the, the Minnesota Care shift into MA to be about 110,000 additional enrollees. These are adults, uh, or these are children, parents, and pregnant women. And when um, when the actual data came in, it appears that we got about 85% of that um, 110,000 additional enrollment. So about 93,000 or so 
of that projected enrollment actually materialized. So what you're looking at here in terms of driving this $437 million enrollment is a number of people shifting from Minnesota Care plus a number of additional people coming in due to the ACA changes um, beginning with in January of 2014. And um, what that translates to is about 7.3% annual enrollment growth over the, the fiscal year 14 to fiscal year 17 in families with kids and about 12% um, average annual enrollment growth in the adults without kids. So we got a little bit less of the additional enrollment than we thought we were going to get in families with kids and we ended up getting a little bit more enrollment than we thought we were going to get in the adults without children. And the reason why that doesn't translate into a bigger increase in the biennium to biennium comparison is because of the enhanced federal match on the adults without children. Um, so that additional enrollment is only generating an $80 million increase um, from biennium to biennium for the adults without children. In terms of the average payment, um, we are projecting about a 4% um, increase, average annual increase, about 4% um, for the, the adults without children and the families with children groups. Um, and that accounts for the, the $295 million um, increase or the $288, um, $290 million increase in, um, in the families with killed children group and it accounts for about a $72 million increase in the Adults Without Kids group. Um, we talked about the, the $420 million um, offset in the Adults Without Children line. Um, that's due to the changing um, federal share, and, um, and that's the, the, the biggest piece in the, the state and local and federal share funding change. The last thing that I will point out is um, <coughs> on row 73, um, there's a $125 million um, biennial increase due to pharmacy rebates. Um, we get rebates back from drug manufacturers based on our um, pharmacy expenditures in MA. And, um, and these are dedicated revenues to the MA account. And they are currently running about, I believe, about $500 million per year in pharmacy rebates. Um, but the $125 million is reflecting the fact that on the adults without kids, just as the feds give us 100% federal share on our expenditures for this group, they take 100% of the pharmacy rebates for this group. And so that change in federal share accounts for the $125 million increase in pharmacy rebates. It's essentially a reduction in state share on those rebates from the 1415 to the 1617 biennium. So I kind of sped up there at the end, but I think I got through it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Welch. Uh, I've got Representatives Driskowski and Liebling, and we'll take some questions for a bit, and then we'll have uh, Mr. Nobles come up. Uh, Representative Dreskowski, I know you've been waiting a while. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Welsh, uh, back when we had the expansion of MA, um, I remember the discussion that uh, this expansion was going to save Minnesota hospitals something like $1.4 billion uh, initially, and that we were going to get $3 for every dollar that we put in. Um, why are these costs going up instead of down? Um, we should be accumulating money if uh, indeed we were going to get $3 for every dollar we put in. Can you uh, shine some light on that? Mr. Welch. Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, what you're looking at here is, the, is simply the forecast of expenditure or the forecast of um, expenditures for, for this group. It, it, uh, it details the enrollment, uh, projected enrollment for this group, and um, and what their expenditures or what their uh, our expenditures will be on this group, it it doesn't uh, it doesn't account for any um, secondary impacts or um, or it doesn't uh, it doesn't account for any comparisons between um, you know what might happen downstream based on the fact that uh, that these people are covered under our MA forecast. 
Representative Driscolski. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Walsh. I'm still trying to learn more about the details of this, and what we were told um, seems to vary a lot from what we are seeing. And, you know, Mr. Chair, I, I know, uh, at least in the Republican caucus, there's a lot of us uh, farm-type people uh, who uh, understand agriculture real well. And when I showed up today, I was appreciative of the food placed out in front of me, but I felt like a steer coming to the feedlot. And uh, uh, there it was. <laughs> <laughs> and that was good, but uh, uh, you know, um, there's other metaphors too, um, and one of them I think that really um, applies real well is that uh, uh, the chickens seem to be coming home to roost. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Mr. Welch, the question that Representative Ruskowski raised, are you saying that uh, in terms of this three to one savings and such that the hospitals are saving um, a bunch of money and that the uh, state is just having more, or are you saying that down the line we're going to uh, see benefits from this that aren't projected in the 16, 17, and 18, 19 uh, budgets? Mr. Chair, um, I, I guess um, I'm saying that in, in my role here, my, my only focus is on the, the forecast and what the expenditures are going to be um, and, and sort of trying to get the forecast right so that the state budget doesn't have a big problem. And in terms of the, 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 the impact of, of these programs outside of the forecast, uh, I, I think I would be the wrong person to try and speak to that. Okay, and we appreciate your efforts to uh, help us understand the forecast. I, I really appreciate your, your efforts today. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you to the testifier. This is um, complicated stuff, and but it's obviously very, very important. So um, as I'm uh, and I appreciated that last answer, that what we're looking at here on this spreadsheet is just one piece of the budget kind of carved out to look at it more closely. So you don't really see the interactions here between um, some pretty important things, most notably what it's done for our economy, our healthcare industry, which is a huge industry in our state as opposed to some other states. And that may indeed be part of our um, the great success we've been having recently in our economy is that we have had extra money going into our healthcare industry. Uh, but the question I wanted to ask, a couple questions. In the last legislative session, I think uh, most of us will remember that the um, GOP caucus was very, very interested in increasing the funding for our home and community-based services. And in the, in the going back to the first year of the biennium, 2013, um, the the DFL had already um, in the in the budget had bought back a cut of 1.67 percent um, from the biennium before, and had allocated an extra one percent in. I'm talking only home and community based services, and then in 2014. The GOP was very insistent that we allocate another 5% increase. And so I'm, I'm wondering where that shows up here on, on your spreadsheet. So those increases, it would have been the buyback of 1.67. Maybe that doesn't show up here because it never actually happened. I don't know. But the, what we put in a total of 6% of new money over the biennium um, for home and community-based services, very much at the urging of the GOP, as I recall. And where would that show up here? Okay, Mr. Welch, I'm going to uh, have you answer that. And then I've got Representatives Wagenius, Albright, and Carlson. And then I'm going to go to Mr. Nobles. Uh, Mr. Welch. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative. Oh, Ms. Snyder. The increases in home and community-based services would show up in the Biannual, biannual average monthly cost difference, um, mostly in the total MA LTC waivers and home care line. Uh, so that's 165.9 million. The increases that you're talking about, the 1% the increase that was effective April 2014, that would have been partially in the first biennium as well. So you wouldn't see as big an increase from biennium to biennium. The 5% that was effective July 2014 would show up as an increase in the second biennium. And then Representative Liebling. Mr. Chair, and, um, I have a second part, a second part to the question, but I'm going to ask you when you speak again to tell us what line you're on. But uh, my second question is that there was also um, 
there is also right now, uh, Representative Schumacher is, has a bill that would raise another, put another, I think, about $200 million into nursing homes. And so I'd like you to just point out what line we're talking about, where that additional $200 million, and that's medical assistance money, where that would go on this spreadsheet. Uh, Ms. Snyder. Mr. Chair, Representative, the, the home and commu community-based services increases that we were talking about are on line 49. Mm -hmm. For nursing facilities, uh, you can go to line 31. So uh, this forecast is based on current law, and so we don't have any increases built in for proposals. Um, we have increases that were um, the main increase that would be that would show up in here for nursing facilities is an increase that will be effective October 2015, a 3.25% increase that was passed, uh, I believe, in the 2013 session. All right, Representative Wagenius. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your saying we should delve into this. And one of the things I am hearing uh, from the witnesses is that there are underlying cost drivers that are driving this up. And so one of the things I want to hope you do is delve even deeper. And the issue I want to bring up is something that has happened since you were in the legislature before. And that is that our Pollution Control Agency has determined that we're spending $30 billion a year on health care because of poor air quality. $30 billion. Even if it were half that much, it would be an astronomical figure. So one of the things that air quality does, and it's intuitive, but it's also factual, um, poor air quality affects um, elderly more. That's intuitive. Because these are long things. <clears throat> it also affects people more in poverty. And it turns out that people in poverty live near highways, which are one of the great producers of poor air quality. So as we are looking into this, it does seem to me that we have to look on that cost driver side too, and that would be one I hope you delve into a little deeper. Well, we're delving, but I don't know if we're going to delve that deep today. Um, but uh, but uh, thank you, Representative Oginius. Uh, I'm open to hearing about it. I'd be very interested to see how we get a fiscal note out of the department for that. But, uh, but anyway, um, thanks for bringing that issue forward. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For Mr. Welch or Ms. Snyder, whomever can answer this. I'm just wondering, as we've gone through this spreadsheet, um, a, a number of these from biennium to biennium have increases. I'm just wondering if you could, in the broad brush, highlight those programs that have an automatic inflator or COLA attached to them. It's mainly the natural. Uh, Mr. Welch, or uh, which ones have an automatic inflator, if any? Mr. Chair, Representative, um, there, are no, uh, there are no automatic inflators in terms of um, rate increases. We include rate increases that are authorized in, in current law. Um, in terms of the, the long-term underlying trends, um, there are no, well, okay, let me step back a bit. So in the, in, in the fee-for-service programs in MA, um, what drives average cost increases in those programs are basically case mix changes, utilization changes, things that affect the, the acuity of the, the populations over time. And the way we deal with those is that we, when we go to do a forecast, we update our actual data. And we look at what the, the new data tells us in terms of the, the recent activity in that group, both enrollment and on the payment side. And if average costs are starting to go up in, in a particular fee-for-service subgroup, then we, we sort of interpret that as something is changing either with the case mix or the utilization of the population that we're, we're looking at. And we'll make adjustments um, in the average payment for that fee-for-service group going forward. And um, on the managed care side, um, 
we have built in for the elderly and disabled basic about a 5% trend in managed care rates um, going forward. And for the families with children and the adults with children, about a 4% trend. And that is based on um, a historical look at what has happened with uh, managed care rates over time. And um, the short story with that is, is so the actuaries get a new, um, a new uh, year of actual cost experience, and they work with that in generating the next um, contract year managed care rate. So for the calendar year 15 managed care rates, the actuaries were dealing with calendar year 13 cost experience and maybe sort of a preliminary peak at um, calendar year 14 data. And so in terms of how we handle the managed care rates is we try to pick um, some trend that is going to sort of balance the risk both up and down in the rates going forward. And we know that in some, you know, in some groups we're going to probably, you know, be above that rate. In some groups we're going to be below that rate, that, that rate. But we don't try to do it on a cell by cell, a rate cell by rate cell basis. We, we pick a, a trend that looks like it's been um, reflective of the, the history. And we, um, we know that we're trying to kind of get it right in the aggregate, if that makes any, any sense. And that's a particularly tricky area because just because rates come in low, for instance, families with kids rates came in low in the 15 contract year. Low, and by low, I mean lower than what we had expected, lower than 4%. But that doesn't mean when we go to set the next contract year that it's going to stay low. It depends on what the cost experience looks like when they update that. And what we found oftentimes is that the rates come down, and then you find that, well, maybe they, they came down a little bit too much. The actuaries, you know, um, when they look at the, the updated data, and it's got to, they've got to make, they got to make some of it back, or they've got to bring it up a little bit more. And so it's not a trend per se in those rates. It's, it's, we treat it like a trend, but it's more trying to pick, uh, um, something that balances the risk and that we come out good in the aggregate. Okay, in the interest of um, trying to get Mr. Nobles up here, I'll, we've got Representative Carlson and then we'll have Mr. Nobles. Representative Mr. Carlson. Mr. Chairman, in that interest, I'll pass. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Welch, Ms. Snyder, uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Really appreciate it. And uh, if you'd stay around, if there's any other questions, I'd appreciate that too. And now I'd like to uh, recognize Mr. Nobles. Our legislative auditor, who I think everyone's familiar with, Mr. Nobles, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Mr. Chairman, uh, I am Jim Nobles, legislative auditor, and thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Ways and Means Committee for having us here today. I also have at the table with me Cecile Ferkel, who is the Deputy Legislative Auditor for the Financial Audit Division. And Mr. Chair and members, we are going to shift from the, ma the very large picture that you just had, the macro, down to the micro because the kinds of programs that we've been talking about really affect people. And eligibility determinations, I think we would all agree, are some of the most important decisions that we make in government, especially for the programs that we were just talking about, healthcare services. The result of those decisions determines who receives government service and who does not. Given the impact of those decisions on people and families, we believe that eligibility determinations should be made in a timely and accurate way, 100% of the time. No person or family eligible for a service should be denied because of a mistaken government decision. And the taxpayers should not be paying for services for people or families who are not eligible. As you know, the rules for deciding who is eligible for these government services, the rules start here with the legislature and in Congress. But then those rules are implemented in Minnesota by the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Ultimately, DHS, on a case-by-case, person-by-person, family-by-family basis, is responsible for making eligibility determinations for medical assistance, Minnesota care, and other publicly funded health care programs. For more than 10 years, the Office of the Legislative Auditor has raised concerns about DHS's ability to ensure that its eligibility decisions are correct. 
For example, in a 2003 report, OLA noted that DHS did not use electronic file matching to verify Social Security numbers or income for Minnesota Care applicants. More broadly, in five audits conducted to test the state's compliance with federal requirements, we concluded that DHS's internal controls did not provide, quote, reasonable assurance, close quote, that the department could prevent ineligible people from receiving benefits. In the two most recent audits, we concluded that DHS had not complied with federal eligibility requirements. In a 2013 special report, OLA again raised concerns about DHS's approach to information verification for people deemed qualified for Minnesota Care. In response, DHS said that the state's development of an online health insurance exchange under the Federal Affordable Care Act would address the concern. Commissioner of DHS Lucinda Jessen said, and I quote, the Affordable Care Act requires states to have an online eligibility application process for Medicaid programs starting January 2014. States must rely on electronic verification sources to the greatest extent possible in determining eligibility and must use the verification available through the federal data hub sponsored by the U.S. Department of Human Services, close quote. And I might say that the reason behind that requirement for electronic verification is a, is a um, concern about ensuring that it's independent and that it's at a source that is not simply provided by the applicant. So as you know, Mr. Chairman and members, Minnesota decided to create its own health care insurance exchange, now known as Minsure. And a big part of the vision of creating Minsure and the promise of Minsure was to provide DHS with timely and accurate assessments of people's eligibility to receive government-funded health care. As a result, DHS officials and staff were directly involved in the development of Minsure. The department's goal was to ensure that Minsure would validate income, social security numbers, citizenship, and immigration status as well as people's enrollment in Medicare. Given our concern about past problems with eligibility determinations, OLA initiated yet another audit last March. But this time the landscape had changed and become yet even more complicated because of the creation of Minsure. And so as you can see from the report that you have that it was not just an audit of, men, of uh, the Department of Human Services, but of the need for the Department of Human Services to oversee Mensure, because now the department is essentially dependent on Mensure to provide it with an eligibility assessment, although the department is still ultimately responsible for determining eligibility. The result of that audit you can see in our conclusion on page six. And we said that the Department of Human Services did not ensure that medical assistance, Minnesota Care, and Children's Health Insurance Program recipients who enrolled through Minsure were eligible for the benefits they received. In addition, we said that the department had many instances where it did not comply with federal and state legal requirements related to recipients' uh, eligibility for for medical assistance, Minnesota care, and children's health insurance programs. We also found that there were incorrect Minnesota care premium rates being charged. The report has 11 findings that support that negative conclusion. And Mr. Chairman, uh, we can go into as much detail as you want or we can leave that for other committees for another day, but I would like to just add one final thing. We've been dealing with this issue for a long time. And at OLA, we understand that the rules for making MA eligibility determinations are extremely complex. And we understand that programming those rules into Minsure was a monumental task. We also know that officials and staff at Minsure, DHS, and Minit have worked extraordinarily hard to build and operate the Minsure system. So we have great sympathy 
for our fellow state employees. But as auditors, we are frustrated and troubled that after more than 10 years and after spending tens of millions of dollars, not only on Minsure, but on an earlier effort called Health Match, which completely failed, we find it troubling to issue yet again negative findings and a negative conclusion on the state's ability to correctly determine eligibility for public health care programs. And Mr. Chairman, with that, would be happy to answer questions. Uh, Mr. Nobles, can I ask the first question? If I look on the next page, page seven, finding number one, I see in the second paragraph it says, we found that nearly 17% of the people in the sample we tested were not eligible for the public health program in which they enrolled. Is that, uh, would you say that 17% is accurate for the medical assistance program? Uh, or is, uh, I, mean, I know that you're also talking about uh, Minsure and uh, Minnesota Care and other programs as well. Uh, do you have a particular percentage of ineligibility for medical assistance? Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Ferkel to answer that question for you. Ms. Is it Perkel? Perkel. Good morning. I'm Welcome Cecile Ferkel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Cecile Ferkel, the Deputy Legislative Auditor. That 17% is across the sample that we took, and the sample cut across uh, three programs, medical assistance, Minnesota Care, and uh, the CHIP program, Children's Health Insurance Program. Uh, I don't have a breakdown of the error rate by those programs, but I know that about 65% of our sample was in the medical assistance program. Uh, thank you. Well, then I've got Representative uh, Davids, uh, Representative Carlson, or excuse me, Khan, and then Carlson. Representative Davids. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I think this meeting concludes at about noon. Is it the chairman's intention to bring Mr. Nobles back? Because, I mean, he's got a lot of stuff in here, and I think we're shortchanging him a bit if we don't hear more. What, what's your intention, Mr. Chair? Well, it's a big topic, uh, Representative Davids. I'm expecting that next week we're going to have a presentation on the governor's budget, but uh, we'll see what we can do. Okay. J just a couple questions or thoughts here. Uh, you mentioned that there's trouble with the feds. DHS is not uh, c complied with the feds. <laughs> What happens? I mean, do they take away your birthday or nothing happens? Or, I mean, something should happen. If they're not complying with federal law, what happens? Uh, Mr. Nobles. And then one follow-up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Davids, well, we do audit work on behalf of the federal government. We fulfill a legal requirement called the Single Audit Act, and we report all of our findings to the federal government. What action they choose to take um, is at their discretion. Um, you know, I would say from my point of view, and I would certainly ask Ms. Ferkel to comment on this as well, it seems to me that the federal government has had a major initiative to ensure that uh, the Affordable Care Act is implemented. And so uh, even though we have reported some of the concerns to the federal government, I personally have not seen, would I, nor would I anticipate, uh, the federal government necessarily taking money away from the state specifically for the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Okay, one follow up, Representative. Mr. Please. Chairman, Jonathan Gruber, an MIT professor, said that Minister would sign up 500,000 people, then he went to 400, then he went to 100, now he's at 67. We'll be lucky if we get 50. And we raised the tax from 1.5 to 3.5, and we can't go above that according to current law. So where Health Match failed, is it your opinion that if they said they had to have 67,000 to make this work? We'll be lucky if there are 50, maybe 52, depends on what the numbers are after February 15th. Is, Minis is Minsure viable into the future with these numbers under current law? Mr. Chairman, no. Representative Davids, um, we will be issuing a report on Minsure itself uh, in mid February, and we will address some of the issues in the Gerber contract. Um, with all due respect, uh, if we could, um, Mr. Chairman, defer that discussion until we issue that report. And, uh, and I know it's of great concern to you. You and I have communicated about your concerns with the Gruber contract. So if you don't mind, if we can defer that. Mr. Chairman, I don't mind. Thank you, Mr. Knowles. Representative Kahn. Yes, well, Mr. Chairman, you know, I try to stay out of issues that I don't really know, like all of Health and Human Services. But the one point that I did put my nose into this process a little bit when the initial Minsure bill was going through was the elimination of Minute from the control of all of the information systems. There was a, 
there's a whole there's a whole section of of 16e which gives the minute control over all state information systems that they were taken out of and I understand the relationships have been a little better with the change of authority in Mincher, but are, uh, did you look at the thought that any of these things were uh, ca caused by the fact that Mincher was operating in s at some levels free of, um, uh, of minute control? I'm and when you do things, I did that in the go first bill first committee the bill went to was GovOp, and I took that exemption out totally in GovOp, followed it, kept following each committee to make sure it was still out, and it went in in the last hour of the conference committee. Mr. So. Nobles. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Kahn, I'm going to give you the same answer I gave uh, oh. Representative David, and that is uh, we are going to be releasing a report in mid-February that is going to address that issue okay. as well. Thanks. Representative Carlson. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I noticed this report was, came out on November 12th, and the period it covered was October 2013 through April 2014. And my question is, uh, if I recall correctly, and it's been a number of years since I was on the Legislative Audit Commission, but I think you have a, uh, an opportunity when you're auditing a state agency to visit with them before the report comes out so they can begin to make the corrections. And my question is, uh, what's the status? Uh, is the department um, moving forward on your various conclusions and recommendations? I think there were 10 or 12 of them or whatever the number was to see if uh, some corrections are beginning to take place. And maybe you can just give a very brief answer. They're moving forward. They're not moving forward. Uh, what do you see down the road? Mr. Nope. Chairman, uh, Representative Carlson, um, on every report that we've issued since 2003, uh, the department has agreed with our findings and committed to implement our recommendations. And so uh, this has been, again, a, a problem of long longstanding, um, and, and it exists not because we disagree, uh, the department and OLA. It, it continues because the challenge they face is very difficult. Um, you can look at the back of this report and see their response. And you can see that they do agree with our findings and they do commit to implement our recommendations. And as I say, that goes all the way back uh, to every report we've issued. And yet, here we are more than 10 years later uh, still with much the same problem. Yes. Yeah, Representative Carlson. Mr. Chairman, I guess that goes to, I, I glanced at the, uh, their response, but uh, wasn't sure being that that was last November if there's actually movement that's taking place. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would just reiterate, and I have a, a whole packet of correspondence between uh, uh, Commissioners Jessen and myself on this issue over uh, many months, and just looking at one statement from a letter she wrote me in December uh, of 2013, uh, indicating uh, in response to an earlier report that these are serious issues, and I, Rep, uh, Commissioner oh. Jessen, is disappointed and frustrated that they have not yet been resolved. We are working with Minsher to correct them. So I can only give you, and I take the commissioner very much at her word, I know these things are very troubling to her. She is very dependent on Minsher to help her correct these problems, and I think she is trying to do everything she can uh, to establish the system at Minsher that will give them correct eligibility assessments. Thank you. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Mr. Noble. So what I'm hearing from you is because of the autonomous nature of Minsure, um, that that's contributing to correcting some of these problems that we're seeing. Is that a correct assessment that I'm hearing from you, Mr. Noble? Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Anderson, um, uh, I, I will again refer to the report we're issuing in February, but I'm actually <laughs> going to give you an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked the right way. Wow. Well. Um, because uh, uh, you did one thing in establishing the Minsure board that I would commend you for, and that is you put the Commissioner of Human Services on the board. Because again, the creation of Minsure was very much about uh, DHS, and the fact that you put the Commissioner on that board, I think, created some leverage for the department to try and get its issues addressed. 
We have been meeting with uh, both DHS and Mentra officials over the last several weeks, and um, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but it's actually referenced to some degree in Commissioner Jessen's response to this report. They have tried to put together a governance structure that is somewhat below the board level, the autonomous board level, that brings together officials at DHS, Mensure, and Minute to try and address some of these problems. I will just conclude by saying when we do issue our uh, report in uh, February, that I do think there are really serious governance issues about Mensure that we do need to address. And we are going to make some recommendations, some options, and as you know in the Senate, uh, the author of the Mensure uh, creation, uh, the legislation to create Mensure has already recommended a fundamental change in the governance of Mensure. Uh, follow up, Representative Anderson. Uh, I'll be very brief, Mr. Chair. And Mr. <laughs> Nobles, just to follow up on Representative Davids highlighted, that report will also show us the worst case scenario if the feds decided to change their mind and wanted to say to the state, you need to ante up this amount of money because you have had un ineligible people enrolled in these programs. That will include that dollar figure of what the state, what our liability is, correct? Mr. Nobles. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Anderson, uh, what we might owe the Fed would be more dependent on what, has, what we have reported here. And again, we have an obligation. We send these reports uh, to the federal government. Um, they communicate their concerns uh, back to the executive branch. To the best of my knowledge, the federal government in these programs has never uh, asked for the state, asked the state to give money back. Mr. Ms. Chair, uh, in follow-up to that, as Jim had explained, we've been reporting deficiencies in eligibility determinations for many years, and there has not been a penalty placed on the state. And my assessment, this is just my assessment right now, the federal government is seems to be very accommodating and very forgiving of the struggles that the state is having. Um, and, and they're not really drawing a firm line about um, penalties. They just want to see, in fact, what it seems to me is that the federal government is providing more funds in order to correct the problems at Minsure. They've recently given an additional grant of $34 million to be used in um, technology changes and upgrades. And I think that their focus really is on um, getting the problems corrected rather than penalizing for errors that have occurred. Well, Mr. Chair. And okay, one last question, and then I've got Representative Dean and Driskowski. Okay, just offline at some point, if you could give me that data. It I, doesn't make me sleep well at night if we're relying on the goodness of the federal government and protecting us from this. So, Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Mr. Nobles for your work on this and we look forward to the upcoming um, report in February. Um, as this was being moved through, there were many, many people uh, who had experienced health match that referred to the audacity of the proposal and attempt to try to do this in the time frames that we had laid out for Minsure. Um, from your, in, in Many of their predictions came true about timelines, about um, working this through, not just in our state, but in just about, in, actually in every single state that tried to do this. Um, from your experience, have you ever seen, in your experience, uh, an agency get it this wrong or uh, not listen to the predictions and the warnings uh, that were very clear to many people? And do you think that that uh, accusation of this as an auda audacious uh, and unworkable proposal. Um, how, uh, how far off base were those? Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, Representative Dean, uh, as I indicated in my statement, uh, programming uh, the very complex eligibility standards uh, is a monumental task. Uh, we tried it once before uh, with Health Match, as you referenced. We spent $41 million and we finally pulled the plug. And it was, uh, I think, by everybody's estimation, a failure. Uh, we need to harness uh, the capacity of big computers to help us make these decisions. Uh, these are very complex decisions. There are many of them to be made. So I think we all understand uh, why we try and try again. Uh, and that's what we're doing with Mensure. Um, I, I think possibly uh, we did underestimate 
Uh, some people did possibly underestimate the challenge and the amount of time it would take. I would say, however, though, it was, uh, we think, certainly quite reasonably funded. Uh, we have spent a significant amount of money on Minsure, uh, so I don't think the claim can be made that it was underfunded. It has been said to us by many people that possibly uh, the timelines uh, were um, unrealistic. Um, that may not go quite as far as, um, as you wanted, Representative Dean, but I think uh, that's what I would add. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Nobles and Ms. Ferkel for all of your work on this. I know I've talked with uh, each of you um, extensively about this in the past and had communications myself with yes. the commissioner on this. And, and members, I, I think um, one thing that Mr. Nobles said that's so important here is that there have been numerous efforts at getting a ha handle on eligibility verification with the agency over 10 years and uh, you, and Mr. Nobles, your office's involvement at least three times or four times, I don't know how many, um, I'm aware of three. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I started asking these questions uh, of the commissioner uh, back, it's been a year and a half or so ago now, and we were told that before uh, Minsure rolls out, that Minsure was gonna be the final point at where all this income, uh, or all this, uh, eligibility verification was actually going to happen and once again it did not and so we're pouring uh, the people's money out so it's it's really I think frustrating uh, for Minnesotans that this is happening um, but the question I would have Mr. Nobles is is it your opinion given I, I and I and Mr. Chair I would I would second Representative David's motion that we that we have more in-depth discussion about this topic at future meetings. Um, but because Mr. Nobles and Ms. Ferkel dug in quite deeply as, as I um, talked with them earlier in this audit, and I think it would be good for us to understand uh, more of that, but is it your opinion that Minsure in its given construct and approach, we have inherently within it the ability to fix it to get income ver ver or, uh, eligibility verification to happen within the current Minsure at some point, or in order, or alternatively, in order to truly get eligibility verification to happen, would we have to scrap Minsure and do something else? Uh, Mr. Nobles. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Dreskowski, um, I think that's too big a question for me to answer. Uh, I think it involves a great deal of technical assessment of the software, and I think those kinds of assessments are frankly going on, um, and, and at some point, you'll probably also want to hear from Minsure um, and Minute um, and DHS uh, on their consideration of that very question. Um, but I do think it is uh, currently uh, uh, under some consideration as to whether or not the, the design of putting it all together under a Minsure and doing the commercial products and the public uh, program eligibility determinations uh, can be made to work. Okay, hey, members, we're, we're at the hour of noon. I've got a couple of other people that uh, do want to ask uh, questions. I guess uh, we can go on for another five minutes if people want to. If you uh, need to leave, uh, go ahead. Um, I do want to, I guess I'd appreciate people maybe focusing any other questions on medical assistance here since that's a real uh, large number that we're uh, focusing on. And I guess I want to ask Mr. Nobles one question. 17% uh, in terms of ineligibility seems like a really, you know, high number. 0.00% uh, probably is, is unrealistic. I guess based on maybe what you've seen in other states or in your experience, would you venture to say what a fair ineligibility rate would be for a program like medical assistance? Mr. Recognize Ch there's always gonna be some error somewhere. Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna have uh, Cecile Furco comment on that, but I would just say, um, you know, given the complexity, uh, given the numbers of eligibility determinations, I, I guess taking your point that you would uh, want to allow for some uh, errors to occur. 
But it does seem to me those errors ought to be found and corrected uh, if they are initially made. Because what I always come back to is the fact that uh, a wrong decision either affects somebody who should be receiving the services or it affects the taxpayers paying for services that they should not be. So it's hard for me to think that our goals should be anything less than 100 percent accuracy. Ms. Perkle, did you have anything else on that or no? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I do want to clarify the 17 percent. It's not that 17 percent of the people that we tested were in the public programs and not eligible. Many of the people that are in that error rate were in the wrong program. They were enrolled in medical assistance, but our testing identified they should have been in Minnesota Care. Or they were in Minnesota Care, and our testing identified that they should have been in medical assistance. There, were, there was some error where there were people that, when we looked at the detail, they were found ineligible. So the 17% is a little bit um, different than just the black and white. Okay. Um, you know, members, I've got, uh, we are over time. I think what I'd say at this point is if someone's got other questions, why don't you take them to uh, Mr. Noble's offline. A couple of other really quick things. A few people, uh, Representative David Driskowski mentioned uh, having Mr. Nobles back again. I know I made an announcement uh, at the beginning of session that if you have topics you'd like to see, people you'd like to see before the Ways and Means Committee, uh, bring them to me. I think these are the sort of overview hearings on large financial topics that we should be having. I'd also like to mention that uh, I'm looking at perhaps having uh, a small change to the rules where we automatically excuse anyone who's not here so that uh, we don't have to necessarily uh, worry about calling us. Um, I, uh, before I go through the official process of publishing that rule, if uh, someone else has something else they think I ought to change, I'll uh, give people one last uh, crack to talk to me about it before we uh, change that. Our next meeting uh, this coming Monday, a week from now, will be on the governor's budget proposal that's due to come out tomorrow. And with that, I would finally say uh, that uh, Representative Dean, uh, Chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, Minority uh, uh, Lead uh, Liebling, uh, you and your committee have your work cut out for you. Uh, with that, the meeting's adjourned. <laughs>